Crossroads Media. What's up, everybody? Yes, yes, yes. We are going to scream about the Philadelphia Eagles for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> what do you know? If you are new to the channel, hello. We talk Philly sports every day. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and you hit that thumbs up button as well. And you can take me on the road with you, all your podcasting platforms. All you got to do is search Sports Talk with Broads, bada bing, bada boom. If you leave a five-star rating and a review, that will help out so much much with the algorithm so thank you and lastly if you want more Broads media content then you can join the community here on YouTube where you will get access to not only our 24 7 discord channel with all of the members but also coffee with Broads live streams twice a week which is eight times a month right here on YouTube it's a blast you don't want to miss it check out all the information down below in the description thank you all I'll shut up and enjoy the show what is going on, everybody? Welcome on in to Sports Talk with Broads. We have a bunch of different topics to go over today with the birds. The two main topics, well, they revolve around Darius Slay and his most recent podcast drama, if you will. And the other is Jalen Hurts. But I want to push those aside from the top here, just for a second. I had to run around earlier this morning, and I normally throw the TV on so the dogs don't bark. I'm not a huge ESPN guy in the morning, but I happened to toss it on just so there's noise, and I hear Rex Ryan, ironically enough, talk about where the Eagles are in his eyes. And one of the biggest problems he sees when he's watching the team out there on the field. And he used the phrase independent contractors doesn't look like a team it looks like a group of selfish men okay and that is so perfectly said I'm not even going to date back to Brian Dawkins right I'm not even going to date back to some of the biggest names in franchise history Reggie White and um, Harold right like no I get that I'm talking about the recent. We have been so used to guys who understand what it means to put on that uniform. Zach Ertz. Jason Kelsey, Fletcher Cox. Them being the obvious. Brent Selleck. Malcolm Jenkins. Who else? Darren Sproles is one that I jotted down. And there are two left standing, Brandon Graham and Lane Johnson. But unfortunately, it takes a lot of bricks to build a house. And I don't think BG and Lane can do it on their own. Hell, when Slay was discussing what type of leader he was, and he's the goofball, which I admire and understand the role because, shocker, I was a huge locker room guy in my prime. Okay, so I know the importance of the character, the guy who gets the fellas to laugh, the guy who gets, you know, the fellas to loosen up a little bit, have some fun, enjoy what they're doing while there's other hardos. And Slay referenced what Jason Kelsey used to do in that room by screaming. And that was the role that he filled. And now that's not there. And it goes a long way when you have a head coach. That doesn't bring that element. It hurts regardless, even if you do have a head coach that brings that element, but it makes it significantly harder. And now we are in a transition as a fan base of not really having those players left in the room that, quote, know what it means to put on that jersey. Maybe Devontae Smith one day grows into that. Maybe Quinion Mitchell one day grows into that. I'm not telling you there's no one who eventually has the understanding. But it takes a lot of bricks. Sorry, hiccups. Takes a lot of bricks. And it makes me uncomfortable with the current state of the room. So I thought that was interesting timing. The football gods had me pop on the television. 
just for that. And that's that. So, okay. Let's get to Jalen Hurts. Because I'm having a very difficult time trying to figure out what's right for him off the field. That hiccup hurts so much, I'm actually having a chest pain right now. So if it happens again, I apologize. If it doesn't, I'd be a happy man. So if you remember three months ago or so, I was informed that the media was driving a non-story because of the way Jalen Hurts answered a question in minicamp. I'm going to replay the audio for you. I was very aware that it wasn't media driven and it's because there's something really weird going down between these two and their relationship. But after hearing Jalen again just a day or two ago and also reflecting back to this answer I'm about to play now, man, if this doesn't open your eyes to reality, I don't know what is. So this is three months ago. Take a listen. You know, Nick being open-minded to change up every, you know, the offense like he has. I mean, what's that say about him? Um, I mean, <laughs> it's a great question. I don't know that I know the answer to it. Well, what have you seen? What have you seen from him as far as doing that? Um, I think he's just, you know, he's been a, you know, great and. Um, you know, the, the messages he's delivering to the team. Um, he's trying to be very intentional in what he's saying. Um, and, yeah. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. That's unbelievable, right? And this will all add up in a second here. It all makes sense of why I'm replaying it. This was Jalen post-game on Sunday. When he was asked about how Nick Sirianni and him handle the messaging to the team. Here's Jalen. You and Nick are obviously big voices on the team as the head coach and the quarterback. As you enter the bye and you want to find an identity, do you two talk about maybe, you know, what you want the message to be to the team or how you kind of want to handle, you know, as you guys go into the second part of the year? We have our moments. What do you mean you have your moments? We have our moments. So you're telling me, remember, right? The coach just talked about how proud he was of Jalen for having such a strong statement towards the team after one of their most discouraging losses as a unit. And they they don't ever talk ever about what they're going to... It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense at all. The stories don't match up. It doesn't align. And what I'm seeing is the head coach is willing to die on the sword for all of his men, even if they don't respect him, which... I respect that move. Now I'm starting to look at Jalen and go, yo, man, you are a leader. You are a face of a franchise. You are a damn quarterback. You have to fake it. Because if you are so open, and that is as open as open gets, you can't get any more insanely wide open that you despise your head coach. And whether you do or don't is a different discussion. Because I wouldn't trust Nick Sirianni if I was a quarterback. Hell, I'd be very aggravated with him. But I wouldn't let anybody know as crazily easily as he is right now. The room smells that. The room sees that. The room reacts to that. Whether Jalen wants Quinion Mitchell to buy in or not, whether Jalen wants Brandon Graham to buy in or not, whether Jalen wants any of these guys to buy into Nick Sirianni or not, who he doesn't believe in, your duties is to act more professional than Jalen is off the field. That's how you lead. So sell a different story. Pretend. And then have your behind the scenes issues when warranted. That's how I feel. But here's how a little wrinkle was added. As you all know, I spent time on the best show ever for about a year. And I saw a clip from Tyrone. 
And this was Tyrone's stance on it. And, and it made me think. It was thought-provoking. What's more important? Actually having them to get right or pretending that they are right? Because what's pretending actually do? Doesn't fix the problems. It just makes the public perception different. It gets viewed different. But isn't the actual important thing of this all is to get them connected, to have them talk it out, to hash out problems, not lie. And he's right. But I don't think you're crazy to want him to lie either. It's almost as if both is true. I want you to lie, and I also want you to fix it. So lie until you fix it. But you are being so blatantly obvious. It's setting off alarms all around the NFL world. This is ludicrous. Quarterbacks are not supposed to act this way when they are asked simple questions and plenty of easy ways to go about it. Think about this. If somebody asked you, what does it say about Nick Sirianni that he's willing to have Kellen Moore step in and to change some of the offense from last year, knowing that that's his side of the football? It says a lot. It's a really easy way to answer it. It says a lot. It's more about the team winning. It's less about Nick wanting all the love, wanting all the praise, wanting all the, you know, All the accolades. He wants the Philadelphia Eagles to win football games. However that comes, whatever he needs to do, he's willing to sacrifice the the sexy new shiny toy play caller. If that's not what he is, then so be it. He wants to win. And I respect the hell out of that. And now let's even dig deeper on these most recent comments. What do you mean? You and... The head coach don't talk about the message being sent to the team. Woof. Either that means they can't even stand one another and they can't even be in the same room, which is what Tim McManus reported on ESPN over the offseason, which was, quote, another media story driven piece of crap, which is not true, which is not true. It's real. You just don't like to hear what's real. You can't just wave the pom-poms. I'm just as much as a fan as everybody else. But when I smell bullshit, you gotta call bullshit. And this Eagles franchise right now is covered in bullshit. So that reflects the McManus report that they can't even be together without a mediator in the room and some of these quarterback meetings and going over film. That's crazy. So that's how bad it is. And then the worst part of it all, knowing that Jalen's still here and he's not going anywhere, the front office elected to keep them both but change the surrounding pieces. Now you know why I was so bothered by me looking at their fix as just plopping Kellen Moore in between the two, thinking that would be enough. And it's not. And quite frankly, I don't even know how much Kellen Moore is involved. I know. It's crazy. I still believe he is. Okay? But I trust Shiel Kapadia, who does an amazing job breaking down the film. And he discussed how much, at times, it looks similar to what we witnessed with Nick when it was Nick's offense. By the way, Brian Johnson, you know where he's at now, right? Yeah, Washington. You know what Washington looks like, right? (laughs) Look at that quarterback. Look at how that offense is humming. We're talking historic levels. Now, it's not all Brian Johnson. I'm just saying... I don't think we even got a taste of what Brian Johnson was supposed to be because of the Nick Sirianni show. I'm wondering how much we are getting of Kellen Moore considering the motion numbers are indicating that it might not be all Kellen Moore. If it is, though, and this is where I'll actually take some pressure off of Nick, 
If Kellen Moore feels he has to change some of his offense and philosophies that he wanted to install all throughout the training camp because Jalen Hurts can't play, then it goes back to, well, we got a huge Jalen Hurts problem, which we already kind of know we do. But do they have to dumb down some of it because Jalen can't do it? I don't know. I find that hard to believe if we're just strictly talking off of motion because think about it. If a player lines up in a certain formation, right, and they snap the ball, if someone was to move pre-snap to a different spot, Jalen can't handle somebody moving pre-snap? If someone was to split out wide, or if instead of moving and splitting out wide, they just lined up wide, if the route's the same, and the only difference was in option A, someone moved, Or option B, nobody moved and it was just the formation you came out of the huddle with. Jalen can't absorb that information? You know what I'm saying? Not from a very basic level, but you get what I'm saying? Oh, man. So what do we do with the quarterback now that he's openly throwing his head coach under the bus? I hate it. I hate it. I think it's awful. What isn't awful is my friends at Garage Beer Baby. No bitterness. Beer that tastes like beer. Definitely not an IPA. Make sure you check out Garage Beer. Their information is down below in the description. When I tell you there's only one beer that I open up my fridge to these days, it's the truth, and it's Garage Beer. All right, look, they can't score in the first quarter. Dating back to six games, it's terrible. And it's more than just the quarterback when that's the case. Same when you're getting outscored 255 to nothing. That's more than just the quarterback is struggling. There are fundamental flaws within your system and your identity from top to bottom. You can see all the versions of all 22 getting broken down. Why are they running this route? Why are they doing this route? Why why do they feel like this is going to work? It's all over the place. And then also Jalen not pulling the trigger and being afraid to throw the football, which is then causing him to hold on to the ball too long, look through other progressions, sometimes not even looking at the proper progressions in order. So it's all jumbled. It starts from top to bottom right now. It's a horrible watch. Horrible, horrible watch. All right, so do we want to get to the Slay podcast thing? Let's do it. The last Eagles podcast I did, I'm a little upset with myself because I had my whole show planned together. So I have my notebook here. I put together my topics. I break them up in order, and then I reference it throughout the show, right? When I glance down. And prior to me hitting record, I had my whole show planned, and then I saw in passing Darius Slay was on the podcast with Micah Parsons, and they were discussing the C.J. Garner-Johnson beef, but I didn't really give it much thought. I just saw it and said, oh, whatever, and then I did my show, and in my show, in passing, I said, eh, whatever, it doesn't bother me, it's a new wave of athletes, and then I moved on from it. I don't like what he did. I don't like what he did. I wouldn't do it. I prefer the Saquon Barkley method. If you're supposed to be on Dan Patrick's show after such a brutal loss, if you feel it doesn't put you in the best position possible or optically it's not great, you call them, you say, hey, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm going to take a, a, you know, maybe a little break here and I'll get back to you. I promise I'll join the show, but just give me maybe a week or two because now it's not the right time for me. Very professional way to handle it. Yes, I prefer that. Two thumbs up, Saquon Barkley. I do feel, though, as much as all the controversy behind the scenes and all the nonsense and what this indicates, because this does describe the foolishness of where the Eagles are. I think that is true. I do. People are taking it so extreme. Like, back in my day, in 1832, we'd never see an Eagle on a Cowboys pod. Yeah, because podcasts from players weren't a thing. It truly doesn't bother me that he went on Micah Parsons' pod if Micah Parsons is on the Cowboys. It it really doesn't bother me. I don't like that he talked about C.J. Gardner-Johnson 
and seeing CJ somewhat quote tweet him on Instagram saying, damn, dot, dot, dot. I, I don't like that side of it. If he kept the CJ Gardner Johnson thing out of his mouth and, and just talked football or just talked other things, I, I don't care. I, I, I really don't care. I don't like what he talked about with CJ, even though he's he's not wrong. Like CJ probably know him and Slay, who are big talkers and like to run their mouth and have goofy personalities. I'm sure they crack up behind the scenes. Go, yo, CJ, you talk that shit and you don't back it up. You're gonna get made fun of forever. And she go, yeah, I know, dude. You know what I'm saying? Like they know nothing he said is breaking news, but it's a bad optic. So you shouldn't even put yourself in that position. On a scale of one to ten, I don't like it around a seven. Okay, I don't like it a seven out of ten, which is a significant number. People are taking it to 14 or 15 on a 1 to 10 scale and saying that Slay's a horrible captain. I don't think he did the right things. I, I'm actually more aggravated with him tweeting out his individual accolades when the game's all said and done because that's more of a reflection on the, you know, I'm not worried about my teammates thing. Look how good I am. And that's not the first time he's done that. He's done that multiple different times now whenever he gets shredded for having a difficult game or something along those lines. And I think Slay could play way more than a lot of people think he could play, even though it hasn't been the greatest start in the world this season. And I'm I'm questioning at times the way that he leads with his personal accolades being tweeted. I, I don't love it. All I'm saying is, I think we've reached a point of insanity with it from some fans. Like, he's such a horrible piece of trash, and he's garbage for talking to his friend in a mic when the game's over. That's the era we live in. I just saw another one. Debo Samuel joined. Oh, man, I forget who he joined. It was another Bleacher Report pod. I think it was on the Lions. Man, whatever. Uh, But 49ers, Lions, NFC Championship game. They're, They're talking about what happened. They're talking about how they feel. This is what it is. And I don't think because he's friends with Michael Parsons that now all of a sudden when the Eagles play the Cowboys, like that's going to change the outcome of the game. They may get shredded because the Eagles stink, but the Eagles don't stink because Slay is friends with Michael Parsons. I don't know. I just don't care about it from the level of friends off the football field and whatnot. It doesn't bother me. But I don't like what he did. Fair enough? Okay. One more piece here before maybe we slip in a couple anytime hotline calls. I heard Vic Fangio speak, right? In his media press conference. And he talked about how the corners can press more depending on the uh, the formations and the splits and, you know, when, when wide receivers are bunched up together and all that. And he pretty much made it seem, if I heard him correctly, that these corners have free range on what they want to do. If they want to press, you can, based off of certain formations. If they want to give more leeway, they can, depending on certain ones. Um, Okay, so if that's the case, right, take that part out of it. Not allowed to give them what they want. Because what they want is Baker Mayfield, death by a thousand paper cuts, and you're giving these wide receivers way too much time I mean, way too much space, excuse me, where you snap the ball, there's not enough time for your defensive ends to get to the quarterback, the ball's out too quickly, you're neutralizing the pass rush within seconds just based off your alignment. You have to take that out of their hands. They don't have a choice anymore, and you dictate it as a Vic Fangio defensive coordinator who's been around the league for 40 years. That's what you have to do. You gave them free range. You gave them a chance to do what they want, but if they clearly show that they don't have the right mindset or the right approach, you then have to step in and make it what it needs to be. So that's what it sounded like in my ears. And I demand change because, as we saw, what they did was not beneficial. All right, let's run to the Anytime Hotline and hear from you beautiful people. Just not good enough at all, bros. Not good enough. I mean, this game was so hard to watch. And then we claw back at 24-14, to and we had multiple opportunities to get some third down stops, and we couldn't. That play, the Cooper DeGene fumble, 14-0, defense gets a stop or offense gets it back. 
we make a piss poor, you know, we make a terrible decision. Isaiah Rogers blocks the guy into DeGene. I still think DeGene maybe could have caught it, but yeah, just yeah, inexcusable. Yeah, yeah. So many self-inflicting wounds this team makes. You saw it last week. You've seen it ever since the 2023 season. This team loves to commit. Those wounds, those self-inflicted wounds. And how many times can a zebra show its stripes before you know, hey, that's a zebra. That's this team. This team is not as good as we think it is. It, they're just not. And, you know, yes, we were without our two superstar wide receivers that are fantastic. Yes, we were without our Hall of Fame right tackle. But it's just not good enough. It's absolutely not good enough. And it's not acceptable. The effort level, the intangibles, you, t- you heard it in the post game with Barrett Brooks, with Sirianni also mentioning it, the intangibles were piss poor today. They were awful. I, I mean, we made so many mistakes in crucial spots in this game. We- there's no chance of winning. There's no chance. Every time we clawed back, we shot ourselves in the foot, and that's why we couldn't even, you know, tie the game or X, Y, and Z. You know what I'm saying? Like, not good enough, man. I mean, this team is very hard to watch right now. They sure are. They sure are. Yeah, it's not good enough. And when you crawl into a 24 to nothing hole, you essentially have to be perfect and then some. To your point of shooting yourself in the foot, you may be able to survive shooting yourself in the foot if you're down 7 nothing because there's plenty of game left. There's plenty of possessions left. There's plenty of opportunities to put points up on the board as long as your head coach knows when to kick it, when to go for it, when to be aggressive, which is a whole nother conversation. Hey, I guess here's the standing ovation in Nick Sirianni. I don't think he screwed up any go for it situations. <laughs> Oh, man, this team pisses me off. But maybe the word you were looking for was fundamentals. Was it intangibles or fundamentals? Because I heard fundamentals thrown out there all the time. And here's the problem. What are the core values of Nick Sirianni? I know for damn sure one of them is fundamental. So you're not doing one of his core values. Connecting is definitely not happening. Him and the quarterback despise one another. And you guys do not seem to be even connected a little bit. You, you, you don't need to be the best friends ever, but my God, you can't be this. So competing isn't happening. Accountability, I don't think is happening. Playing smart football isn't happening. None of this is happening. And that's what you preach as a coach. So if you are constantly failing at the fundamentals and failing at the basics of the game, it means either the coach isn't installing it, or if he's trying to install it, nobody's listening and the messaging isn't working. If that reflects maybe who's in the room and piss poor you know listening on their end and so be it but the way this league works and professional sports works is you can't get rid of 53 men you can get rid of the one man and the one man makes no sense because he shouldn't have even had the job to begin with him Vic and Kellen Moore forget the team for a second being one they're not one and it's important for them to be one because when you are a coach and you pick your guys there is a belief to the core on why you were picked why you were selected you're starting a new fresh regime. You're going to a franchise. I want him as my OC. I want him as my DC. And then there becomes a bond. There's no bond at all. And now what they have to do is waste their bye week on foolishness. Foolishness. (laughs) They have to waste it on on figuring out this instead of self-assessing the way that you really want to do during your bye week. Mm -mm -mm. What's next? Uh, pitiful, very pitiful. Um, I just can't even really compartmentalize my words. The Eagles do it to me again. Um, I think we're slowly ruining Jalen Hurts with the way that we're calling plays. We're trying to make him become like Patrick Mahomes or something when he's just not that. I think Jalen's a great quarterback. I just think we need to limit the amount that we have him throwing the ball and limit the concepts that we're throwing at him. We need to make things simple for him, and we aren't doing that. We're making things super complex for him. Time out. I'll let you continue. But if you're saying that Jalen Hurts is being asked to throw the football too much, or if we are having too much, com- you know, it's it's too complex for him, then he's not an NFL quarterback. I don't know if we're asking him to be Pat Mahomes, 
but we're asking him to be a very good quarterback who gets paid a lot of money. If we start to say we need our quarterback to do significantly less because asking him to do the reasonable amount is too much, then he's not the quarterback you think he is. And I'm a Jalen Hurts fan. I'm a believer in Jalen Hurts, and I have been not in the very beginning. I I won't say in the very beginning when everything happened with the Wentz contract and all that. I I thought it was a little silly. But once he showed us he could ball, I thought, yeah, no, he could ball. And it's very strange to have a quarterback enter the year, enter the career, excuse me, not turning the ball over and then becoming someone who's turning the ball over. And Um, I think a lot of this does fall on him, though. I think he's trying to show something, prove something. And it it, it also correlates with this hating of Nick Sirianni. There's something going on here. But the main point is, if you're asking him to do less because you're afraid you're asking him to do too much, you don't have the right quarterback. Because I don't think they're asking him to do something absurd. I don't. I don't think the Eagles are asking him to do anything crazy. I think they're just asking him to be an NFL quarterback. The blocking isn't holding up, and he's making a bunch of mistakes that makes him look like he's a rookie again, and I feel like I'm dealing with Carson Wentz. Uh, The play calling just needs to be better. It needs to be so much better. The defense needs to be so much better. I understand the bend not break, but we need to be We need to be not breaking. There's no reason why we give up first down after 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 first down. down. The tackling is poor. The coverage is poor. The pass rush is poor. Everything needs to improve on the defense. And the play calling needs to improve on the offense. We need to fire Nick Sirianni. That's probably all. Thank you. (laughs) So I agree on the defensive part of it. I just don't know if they're good or if they have what it takes to turn it around. I really don't. Um... What else? Yes, Nick Sirianni, I'm out on. But you said it it feels like you're watching Carson Wentz again, but that pretty much summarizes what I'm saying. Carson, it turned out he couldn't play. It turned out, while there were problems, and Doug was a part of that problem, and you're seeing that in Jacksonville right now, unhinged Doug Peterson might be my favorite version of a head coach ever. I mean, he's throwing guys under the bus left and right, knowing he's about to get canned in Jacksonville. It's actually comical. Um, So he played a role in the Carson Wentz downfall, too, no doubt about it. But as we we learned Carson Wentz was a bigger deal than we thought originally, right? Well, if you feel you're watching Carson Wentz 2.0 again, that shows you that you know, I'd be watching a quarterback that isn't as good as we originally thought. And that's a that's a very sucky thing to come to. That's a sucky realization at the end of the day. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this episode. I appreciate you all hanging out with me. Thank you so much. You guys are the greatest in the world. And I will, I will talk to you all on the next one.